Welcome to our AUC Author Series. In this series of interviews, we highlight the creative and academic works of our Atlanta University Center members. Our guest today is Professor Love Henry Welchel, Professor of Church History at the ITC. We'll be discussing his latest book, Sherman's March and the Emergence of the Independent Black Church Movement. Uh, Dr. Welchel, we are so happy to have you here. Thank you very much for coming and agreeing to be interviewed again. Um, I was, uh, I want to tell the listening audience, Dr. Welchel was my first interview here um, sometime back, two or three years back. And so we got started off with a bang and we're uh, believing that the encore is going to be just as good. Mm -hmm. We are talking today about Dr. Welchel's uh, newest effort uh, from Palgrave Publishers called Sherman's March and the Emergence of the Independent Black Church Movement. So thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. I'm yeah. honored to be here. Thank Great. you so much. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, the book itself deals with uh, the, the independent black church movement and Sherman's March and how those two intersected. My, I wanted to start, though, with mm -hmm. a question about motivation. Was it the, the anniversary of the, uh, the proclamation, the Emancipation Proclamation, which was, I think, 2012, the 150th, or was it, you talk in the first few pages about that there's a profound crisis in the black church uh, today and American religion and American government. What, what motivated you to, to start this? Oh, well, I think what, uh, what motivated me to start this is the, uh, the, that I wanted to do something for the 150th anniversary. Hmm. Of Sherman March, right. 150 years ago. Right. As a matter of fact, uh, we would be able to be sitting here 150 years ago, talking as we are now. Right. Because that was slavery. Yeah. 150 years ago. Right. It was still going on, and uh, the the point of the book and uh, the chronology that I want to uh, lift up is that Abraham Lincoln signed what we call a preliminary uh, proclamation on September the 22nd, mm -hmm. uh, 1862. Right. And the uh, a proclamation was this, if uh, the states in rebellion, that is the 11 states and the Confederacy, if they did not return to the Union by January the 1st, 1863, right. then he would sign the Emancipation mm -hmm. Proclamation, okay. which meant that uh, these 11 states would lose their slaves because slaves would be free. Right. Well, you know the story. Yeah. Uh, and that's the reason watch night service and our black churches and uh, all churches because this is a really this a watch night service is a Moravian celebration. Right. It was brought here from the Moravians, but there were black people uh, celebrating and a, a part of this in the black and black churches and white churches before uh, the end of slavery. So uh, and uh, January the uh, well, December the thirty first, eighteen sixty two. Uh, African Americans uh, all up and down the uh, eastern seaboard, all the way from Boston to South Carolina, uh, feel that churches watch night service because they were expecting Lincoln to sign the Emancipation mm -hmm. Proclamation. Okay. They were in great anticipation. Yeah. It was a robust service up and down the East Coast, starting in Boston, George Street Baptist Church, African Baptist Church, uh, uh, New York City, uh, Abyssinian Baptist Church. Some of you might know that. Right. They were all they, they were packed to the rafters, waiting to see. Yeah. You know, it's, it was exciting. Uh, you know, when the clock would strike twelve, uh, they were just wondering what Lincoln was going to do. Yeah. And uh, finally, when they found out uh, that uh, Lincoln had signed the Emancipation Proclamation about uh, 10 minutes of 12. And one lady ran down the aisle of Tremont Baptist Church in Boston and said, he might not come when you want him, but he's always on time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is uh, what brought about uh, the Emancipation. So this was 1863 now. Right, OK. OK, this uh, Sermon's March, of course, is in 1864, Right. a year later. Yeah. All right? And now uh, uh, the emancipation has been signed, so the African Americans who are in the states of rebellion, that is the 11 Confederate states, they are free now. Right. Uh, that is uh, legally free, but some of them still have not been uh, physically set free. Right. Yeah. But they were physically free. And many of them uh, had um, joined the Union Army. Right. As a matter of fact, uh, the North was losing the war, mm. the Civil War. 
But actually, the thing that made the difference was the uh, African American soldiers who joined the Union Army after the emancipation. Uh, so this preliminary emancipation uh, really um, in 1862 that was signed by Abraham Lincoln, this really diminished the strength of the South right. and really ultimately led to uh, the Union Army winning the war. Okay. And uh, this is about the march, the 150 years All right. of celebration. Um, but it, it, there's, there's a thread running through this book that, that starts much earlier mm -hmm. than the Civil War that talks about the development of slavery and white supremacy. Yeah. And you talk about the slave trade was rationalized by the European nations saying that they were bringing Christianity to mm -hmm. pagan people, mm -hmm. but the contradiction they found themselves in mm -hmm. was what do you do once they are mm -hmm. baptized as right. believers? Should right. they not be freed by English custom and civil right. law? They should have been. So uh, could so, you speak to yeah, that, that was the contradiction? Too. Yeah. That was the dilemma, the dilemma, you know. The, I think uh, uh, Murdoch has written a book, uh, Gun Gunyard Murdoch has talked a book about the American dilemma. Right. And this was the, one of the early dilemmas of, uh, of enslaving Africans and bringing them to this country. Uh, there was a pope by the name of Nicholas V in 1492. And he sent out a decree that, uh, that uh, all the pagans uh, should be converted and brought to Christianity. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, the Europeans used this uh, rationale uh, to uh, get themselves involved in the European Atlantic slave trade. Right. And uh, the excuse, uh, I said excuse because it was not really the, the rationale. The excuse they gave with the endorsement of Pope Nicholas V uh, they rounded up people in Africa and said they were bringing us over here, that is, African Americans, right. uh, Africans at that time. They were bringing them to the New World to Christianize them and to civilize them. Yeah. But the real deal was not to Christianize them and to civilize them because they already had a civilization. Right. Christianity originated in Africa. Civilization originated in Africa. Humankind itself originated in Africa. Africa is the mother of everything. Right. You know? And everybody. But this was the, uh, the, the excuse that they gave for bringing them over here. So, uh, but uh, to Christianize them and to civilize them. But this was the catch-22. After they brought them over here and uh, started uh, Christianizing them, and they were being converted, as you said, there was an English law that it was against the law for another Christian to hold another Christian as a slave right. after they committed the verdict. But guess what they did? They found an excuse for that. Yeah. They had a stigma, the reason uh, the, the African people were an anomaly, they were different from anybody else because of the what? The color of their skin. Right. And they said, because of the color of their skin and the texture of their hair, guess what? This is the curse of hell. Right. And because of that stigma, uh, we can uh, free their souls, but they cannot free their bodies. Mm. Yeah. This was, the, this was the way they got out of that, and this is what they used uh, as an excuse uh, to sanitize right. the horror and the evil of enslaving African right. people. Yeah. yeah. And part of that process was they developed the plantation mission, right? That was an effort to control the African access to the word and the truth. And so, but this Africa, this uh, plantation mission was tightly controlled by whites. They changed from a word religion, mm -hmm. literacy, mm -hmm. to an oral religion right. where they would just get the message mm -hmm. from whites. And this was mm -hmm. sort of the beginning of the, of them telling them about white supremacy. Is that right. what was going on there? Yeah, well, uh, you have to chronicle this. You're right, the, the plantation mission, that comes a little later. Okay. Uh, but prior to the plantation missions, you, and after African Americans were being converted uh, to Christianity, uh, there was a particular the Anglican Church uh, had the uh, Society for the Propagation of Gospel. And this society was uh, a society to teach uh, Africans to, to be Christians. To be, it's, it's almost impossible to be a Christian 
and to be illiterate because you have rituals. Right. You have the Lord's Prayer, you have responsive readings, you have Apostles' Creed. So, you know, it is necessary for them to have uh, at least a fundamental literacy right. if they're going to be able to participate in the worship services. So, therefore, uh, some of the mainline denominations uh, gave uh, well, black people, or African people, what they call religion with letters. Mm, okay. That was religion to teach them to read and write. Um, Carter G. Wilson, the famous African American historian who has written The Miseducation of the Negro, yeah, most people right. are familiar with that. He said when the, they decided to provide black people religion with letters, this was the dawn of a new day. Mm. Because they were able to learn and to write. Yeah. So guess what? A lot of African people were attracted to American Christianity, not so much for the religion, but for the opportunity to learn to read and to write. Mm -hmm. That is the reason that uh, education and religion are like love and marriage and a horse and a carriage. They go together. You can't have one without the right. other. Right. Religion and in Christianity, because that's the way it was during this particular period with religion with letters and that's how they began to learn how to read and to write and became interested in the church. I mean the, the, the motivation, the incentive for African people to learn to read was to be able to read the Bible. Right. Yeah. Read the Bible. Yeah. But uh, this was this was causing the the that Christianity with letters yeah. was causing the yeah. whites problems, right? Because Absolutely. the blacks were beginning to learn the truth. Learn the truth. And realized but then blacks began to change their demeanor. They began to feel good about themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. And they began to ex express themselves and uh, and uh, you know, you become uh, literate, uh, you become liberated. Right. You know, in spirit at least, in psychology, in feeling this way. And also what else happened is was the uh, slave revolts. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that are celebrated, Denmark Basie, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, and, and other slave revolts that happened. And the, uh, uh, the slave owners said, well, what can you attribute this to? Denmark Basie, Nat Turner. <laughs> so guess what? They attributed it to education, right? learning to read and write. Mm -hmm. So as a result of this, look, our slaves, are, they're not staying in their place anymore. Mm -hmm. They are being more assertive now. Right. Okay? So, they, so the slaves are on us, so we're going to address that. So now, instead of a religion with letters, they come up with a religion without letters. Right, right. What they call oral religious training. Yeah. Okay? They'd be married in the church. Some of these young people here are looking now, where you have a line in hymns in the black church, and was also in the white church. Now, this is a cappella singing, mm -hmm. where the uh, religious leader, or the song leader, will get up and line a hymn, like a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify. And then the, co the congregation will sing after the hymn has been lined. Yeah. This is what you call oral religious okay. training that you repeat what the leader says. Right. And they came up, and then the other thing that with the uh, religion with letters, they would, uh, black people or the slaves began to read a scripture like, uh, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Yeah. And the slave owner didn't want to believe that. Right, right. You know? that, that was going against the grain of what they were teaching. And then when they had religion without letters, the slave owners and the slave, white slave preachers would read to them passages that would condone and support slavery. Mm -hmm. Passages like, slaves obey your master. Yeah. See, passages like that to make them docile slaves. And this was when they came up with the plantation missions. Mm -hmm. And these plantation missions were sponsored by mainline denominations. Mm -hmm. The Baptists, the Methodists, they provided uh, ministers to give them this oral religious training. And this oral religious training was designed to make them better slaves. Right. 
right. or submissive and meek and humble, you see, to serve their particular purpose of making them better slaves. All of this was uh, going on, this came along with the plantation missions and uh, you know they began to be, this was the beginning of the institutionalization of blacks in American Christianity. Yeah. You see and even before this even before you had religion with letters and religion without letters uh, you had a radical movement. See the black church in its uh, inception was a radical movement. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason it's a radical movement because you can't understand the history of the black church without understanding the invisible institution. Right. See, uh, that is, in American slavery, it was against the law for five African Americans to be assembled or to congregate without the presence of a white man. Mm -hmm. So, black people were in these churches, in these white churches, uh, but they had to have, uh, so that they could be supervised. Mm -hmm. The slave, uh, slaves would go with their masters to church, and they had a special, this is where you get segregation from, Jim Crow. Jim yeah, Crow started right. in the white church. Right. They what was the phrase you used? Segregation through integration, or do I have that backwards? No, the, Inter the integration the, through the segregation. Invisible no, no, uh, but this this thought of the uh, the black being with the white in the church right. brought about this segregation by way of integration. Yeah, or, but, right, but yeah. Yeah, integra that segregation by way of integration. Yeah. They were in the same building. Together, right. But the seating, you know, was yeah. separate seating. In other words, it's very interesting, and it's kind of ironic, that both integration and segregation originated in the church. Right, yeah. Yeah, you know. But they, but it, it seems that um, this uh, freedom was something that was too strong to be held down because even yeah. the plantation mission you write uh -huh. uh, allowed the blacks to uh -huh. begin to form social yeah. structures yeah. and take care of themselves. And mm -hmm. then by the 1840s and 1850s, uh, they had come to, you could relate the story about them refusing uh, communion at one particular yeah. church, and they were given yeah. their own worship yeah. uh, uh, structure, yeah. even though it was still controlled by whites. But yeah. there was some inevitability; something oh, yeah. was moving, wasn't it? Yeah, it was moving because they continued to have church like they were right. having it in Africa. Yeah. See, the religion, uh, the African religion, uh, was systematically suppressed. Uh, that is. Uh, Africans didn't come over here spiritual and cultural destitutes. Right. They had a civilization. Yeah. They had a rich religious heritage, but they couldn't practice their religious heritage. Mm. And uh, because of the white people, uh, European people, they brought a different type of uh, worship style. Uh, white people are more laid back. Uh, they have more of um, a religion of the of the of the of the, of the head and. Black people sometimes have more religion of the hands mm -hmm. and, the, and the heart, feelings, and this sort of thing, and you know, just a, a cultural difference. So they couldn't practice the, this type of religion. In other words, they couldn't uh, shout, couldn't be demonstrative right. in their religious experience, you know? And, uh, but they found a way or made a way. That is the reason you had what we call the bush harbor. That is the invisible institution. Okay. That is actually the genesis of the black church was in the hush hop okay. and the bush hop. Can you remember? explain that? Yeah. yeah. This was uh, late in the, mid in the midnight hours. That was uh, away from the prying eyes of the slave master. That black people would go into the woods uh, down by the riverside where you couldn't hear nobody pray. Yeah. That's the bush hop. Okay. It was a secret service. Okay, clandestine secret service that they would practice, and uh, and though it was, and the white people didn't know anything about the bush hop. Mm -hmm. You know, and here they would preach and they would sing, they would express themselves. It was a, it was an emotional catharsis. I don't think they could have survived without this emotional catharsis. Mm -hmm. You know, this was outlet. This is this is how they spell relief. Right. The, the song, you can see it from some steal away. 
that they would be in the cotton fields of Georgia, the tobacco fields of South Carolina. And during the day, about midnight, they would start humming, I mean, steal away, steal away. This was a cold language. Yeah. That they were announcing that they were going to have a church service at midnight down by the riverside. Now, and they didn't want the white people to understand what they, right. it's not like the book of Revelation. Yeah. Revelation is not intended for everybody to understand. Yeah. But only the people who are going through something are the ones to understand it. Right. And that's the way the, the slaves are. You know, the oldest uh, Negro spiritual, guess what it is? I don't know. Go down, Moses. Oh, okay. Way down in Egypt land. You know, tell old Pharaoh. Now, see, they couldn't come out and say, uh, tell old uh, George Wallace, or tell those white folk to let us. But when they would say, go down in Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh, they were really saying, Lord, go down in Alabama. Yeah. In Georgia and Mississippi, right? You see, so they spoke in codes. Yeah, you see, so now, they could get that release call. Now let me ask you, just break in yeah. from this is a little sidetrack here. Yeah. Uh, I had read something within the last year about how the the Africans were not uh, participating in Christianity when they were doing this. They were. It was code, but it was code for escaping slaves. And it was the Underground Railroad and, and telling slaves how to avoid certain things, but it didn't have anything to do with Christianity. And what I'm hearing you say is, yes, it may have been that, but yes, definitely there was some religious activity here. There was something that was real and it was... Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. It was, it was something that was real. And one reason you you know it was real and it was a religious activity uh, that... Um, that they brought uh, from Africa, uh, from Africa, is that uh, in the 18th century, um, you had what was called the First Great Awakening, and that was sort of when you had the religion with letters. But and uh, you know the, the, the way we were trained. But uh, in the 19th century, you had what we call the Second Great Awakening. And actually, this Great Awakening started in Europe. Mm -hmm. Started with the Germans, by the way. Is that uh, the Germans, um, you know, began to feel that religion was too stoic and too unemotional. And real religion is about feeling mm -hmm. and about religion of the heart. Sly Marker. Mm -hmm. uh, the Sly Marker, the German right. theologian, saying, uh, true religion is a feeling of absolute dependency on God. Mm. See? And prior to this time, European placed more emphasis on our religion of the head rather than religion of the heart. Right. But with the Second Great Awakening, guess what? The Europeans, which started in Germany, uh, came to the Great Awakening here in America with uh, George Whitfield, even John Wesley. Mm -hmm. You know, you have any Westerners in your Methodist? Mm -hmm. All was gay. 1738. Yeah. His heart was what? Strangely warm. Yeah. Okay? He was a part of this Second Great Awakening. And that's one reason so many black people uh, gravitate toward Methodism and the Baptists mm -hmm. because of this heart religion yeah. that they brought over here and they read. And it, it was, they already had it. They brought it with them. They kept it with them even when they weren't able to express right, it right. through the uh, uh, invisible institution. But here, here, now white folk getting the Holy Ghost. Right. They began to shout. <laughs> they began to speak in tongues. Yeah. You know? And I've written an article where they call it How America Got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a little fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, white people, Europeans, they were they, they were late. They were yeah. not even late. Right. This, but we brought it, man. Yeah. <laughs> what a great story, man. <laughs> but that is a, that is a matter. That's a fascinating story. Yeah. That came along with the uh, with the the plantation missions and the and all of this is going on simultaneously. Right. Okay. So you, this is sort of the the, the nascent 
uh, beginnings of the black independent church movement, right? When they uh, told the, the story was that the one day they refused to take communion yeah. and a congregational meeting was yeah. called. Why are you not doing this? Well, they were very circumspect. They mm -hmm. said, we just don't feel the proper time because yeah. we don't know what our place okay. is here. Yeah. They were eventually in several churches mm -hmm. given their own place of worship. Mm -hmm. And that takes us then to Sherman coming through. Now, Sherman mm -hmm. was no champion. Oh, of no. the black man Absolutely. at all. No, no. But when he came through, um, he would often with this, uh, they would destroy everything or use what they could. Mm -hmm. So they had in this one particular church in Marietta, I believe, mm -hmm. they used it for a hospital, mm -hmm. which allowed the mm -hmm. black church to become sort of uh, yeah. independent mm -hmm. of them. So was this, as Sherman moved through, was this the beginning of that? Was that really the beginning of this independent church movement down south? Oh, no. The beginning of it, as I said before, it was, it was already was there. They just couldn't express it. Okay. They, um, it, where they had to, uh, you know, it was a kind of an underground church. Right. That you, you know, it, it was, it was already percolating. It was already, already there, you know, that this, this is what I call radical Christianity. Yeah. And they were going against the grain, you know? Yeah. Um, you, you have to be very diplomatic. When you're living under oppression, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we talk a lot about liberation theology, but with black people during slavery or during the Maafa, uh, it was not uh, so much about liberation theology, it was survival theology. Right, right. How do I get from point A to point B, B in a situation like this? Yeah. So it was going on, but, and, and as a, this is, uh, the, the church that you're talking about is Zion Baptist Church, 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, about this time of year, a Sherman uh, was in Marietta, the Union Army. Right. Boots on the ground, 150 years ago. Just 150 years ago, he was in Marietta. Boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, the people in Marietta was was shaking like a leaf on a tree. Mm -hmm. You know what they were saying 150 years ago in Marietta? The Yankees are coming. Yeah. The Yankees are coming. People are leaving Marietta. Right. Because of the war. They saw the Union soldiers, man, coming. And here, uh, Sherman, as you said, he was not a champion of uh, black liberation by any means, but he was a professional soldier. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And he had a job to do. Yeah. Okay? And this was very decisive. Because there was an election of a president, you know, uh, coming up in uh, uh, 1864, and Lincoln was running, and the outcome of this war, without no doubt, undoubtedly, would determine the outcome of that election. Mm -hmm. So this is something that, you know, that uh, Abraham Lincoln and Sherman were taking very serious because this was at a crucial point in the war. Mm -hmm. So they had to get this war. So when he got to Marietta, as you're right, when he came to Marietta and they, the city of Marietta surrendered, and here are the uh, members of the First Baptist Church. These were, this was the white church. Mm -hmm. And there were black members of the First Baptist Church. They had been members of that church since 1836. Okay? Yeah. Black people had been, you know, at this white church. As I said, the, the, first one, the, the church was the first church to integrate. And... Uh, he segregated at the same time, right. uh, you know, because of the way the situation was. So they had been there, and they had been petitioning the white church for their. They wanted their own pre, their own freedom. They wanted their own black preacher. Right. Uh, you remember reading about Ephraim Ruckner? Mm -hmm. He was an exhorter. He was a preacher. He wanted to marry black people. You know, uh, baptize their own babies. You know. He wanted to do this uh, in their separate services, but the white people were very reluctant about this, okay? Because they did not want them to get uh, beside themselves in terms of this uh, kind of thing. But when, when Sherman came uh, in 1864 and, uh, you know, took over the city, uh, he liberated the church. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they had already been liberated but the slave masters didn't uh, liberate them, didn't let them know they had been liberated, because he liberated them, remember, in 1863. Right. When he signed the Emancipation Proclamation. 
but still they were not free. Mm -hmm. Just like Juneteenth that we had a few days ago. Right. Uh, one of the reasons you need Juneteenth is because the slave masters in, in Texas didn't tell the slaves that they were free. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, somebody had to go down there later and let them know that they were free. <laughs> okay. So what uh, what Sherman did was to let the Zion Baptist Church, the black people, know you're free now. You're independent. But you don't read about this in history. Yeah. When you read history, I call it whitewashed history, you would think that uh, the whites in Marietta uh, let the mm -hmm. black church go free. But that's not the case. It right. was Sherman right. who liberated the black church in Marietta. Yeah. And the march kept on from Marietta. You don't mind me moving on? No, yes, please. Moving on from Marietta to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Okay? And... Uh, September the 2nd, 1864, is when Atlanta was burned to the ground, okay? And he took over institutions in Atlanta. And uh, one of the churches that were black churches in Atlanta that was an appendage, a subordinate to the white church. See, these black churches were appendages. Right. You know, they were subordinate. To the white, still trade. controlled, still controlled. They right. wanted what white. They had white trustees, officers, ministers. They were still the whites were still in control. Well, you had a church like that here in Atlanta. It was a part of what the, the white church was called Union mm -hmm. Church, and this church was Big Bethel, Bethel A.M.E. Church mm -hmm. on Auburn Avenue was one of those churches founded in 1847, yeah. and he sat uh, that church free. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it became a free church. Yeah. And uh, uh, that, that is, uh, you know, uh, you know, so much history comes out of, uh, of uh, a Bethel AME church. And then he kept on marching after he had burned down Atlanta and uh, I got the, the freedom for, for Bethel church. He moved on from uh, Bethel to Stone Mountain. Mm -hmm. Here was another church, Bethsaida. Baptist Church. It's in standing in, in Stone Mountain today. Uh, it was an appendage of the first Baptist Church of Stone Mountain. He set that church free. Yeah, yeah. And black people were so appreciative to having their freedom in Stone Mountain today, there's a section of town called Sherman Town. Yeah, right. Okay. That was because of Sherman. Yeah. On his march in 1864. Well, he didn't stop there. Mm -hmm. He kept on going east to Covington. Mm -hmm. And here, there was another uh, uh, church of black uh, members who uh, wanted their freedom and wanted to be independent. They were uh, a part of, uh, of what we call the First Baptist Church of Covington, Georgia. They wanted to be free as well. And Sherman set them free. And now, today, it still stands. It's called the Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. A Baptist church. As a matter of fact, uh, Martin Luther King's uh, maternal grandfather was a pastor of that church. Yeah. Also, his uncle was a pastor of that church. When Martin Luther King was a little boy, uh, he would uh, visit that church in Covington, uh, Georgia. This was a liberation mm -hmm. and him setting them free. And, and here, as I said before, to show that black people wanted to be free. When Sherman would come to these places, uh, black people were so happy to see Sherman and to see that they him, that they were free that many of them followed him. Right. Some 30,000 followed him yeah. all the way into Savannah. Yeah. And, but it wasn't an easy road for them often, oh, no. the, the ones that followed he, Sherman. He didn't want them to follow because yeah. he had to feed them, had to take care of them, and there's a lot of uh, some mistreatment, some right. abuse went on with them and sexual abuse and all that thing with the soldiers. So there are some uh, dark episodes and uh, writings and the, the way that went on in terms of him following him. But the point is, is to show that African Americans were very aware of what was going right. on and they had an insatiable hunger to be free. Yeah. As a matter of fact, some of the uh, uh, slaves looked upon Lincoln as, as being Jesus. Oh, wow. Uh, as being deliberated. Right. So I mean, we bow down to him and say, thank you, Mr. Jesus. Yeah. Because Jesus is considered a liberator. Yeah. He came to set the sinners free. Yeah. And they looked upon him in that way in terms of this particular aspect. But you're absolutely correct in terms of the abuse. And now the, um, 
And they place that. You know, if, you have, if you have any questions, uh, well, in between. I, I, let I me, do. This, let me shut up. We're, we're, no, no, <laughs> shut up. It, we're in Savannah, yeah. and it, it's, it, Savannah is an interesting case for the black people. They, uh, and I want you to explain it, the, the way that they came out of this was different than for most blacks in the rest of the South. Could yeah. you explain why that was? No, it, God works, I guess, in mysterious ways. The war couldn't have ended in a better place. It was the most prepared place for the Civil War to end anywhere in the country, I would say. Because they had already had established black institutions. Um, the first independent black church, see the, the uh, independent churches uh, that um, Sherman liberated on his march was an unintended consequence of his march, uh -huh. you know. Right. This was not necessarily intended. And that is one reason when you read uh, the mainstream uh, history books, you read nothing about these independent right. church movements. Right. That's the reason I think it's so very, very important, so very, very uh, significant that we make this a part of the literature. Right. That's, uh, this is a part. See, much of our history has been omitted, particularly African Americans, or it has been distorted. Um, uh, black history has been an orgy of forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. You know? Uh, and uh, that is the reason it is important for us to get these stories out here. And one reason Savannah was so important is because Savannah uh, is a part of the origin of the independent black church movement, right. which began in Silver Bluff, South Carolina, in 1773 and 1775. Mm. That was during the Revolutionary right. War. Okay. And uh, there were black people who, Galfin's farm, uh, there was, uh, that got uh, converted and started their own independent black church. It is called the Silver Bluff Church. Mm -hmm. It stands today uh, right outside of Augusta, right across the Savannah River. Right. That's the history. It was kind of the incubator for the independent black church movement. Uh, during, the Civil, during the Revolutionary War, what happened is, is that the members of the Civil Bluff Church, um, they joined the uh, English, that is, uh, they did not join the, uh, uh, the Confederate, not the Confederate, but the Revolutionary, the American uh, fighters on right. the, the side, but they, they sided with the, the British. And the reason they sided with the British is because if they sided with the British, they figured they could be, what, free, mm -hmm. okay? Right. And fought on the British side rather than the American side. Yeah. And after they joined the British, they went with the British uh, to Savannah from Silver Bluff, down the Savannah River mm -hmm. to Savannah. This was in around uh, 1775. And when they got to Savannah, guess what? They planted the first African Baptist church. Mm -hmm around 1778, okay? This was the church that they planted. And out of this church, of course, you had a uh, second African Baptist church, third African Baptist church. Uh, the leaders of the Silver Bluff Church uh, were George Lau and David George. David George, after the uh, British lost the war, guess what? David George went to Canada. Okay. So he would not have to go back into slavery. Right. Uh, George Lau, guess what? Went to Jamaica. Yeah. So he would not have to go uh, back into uh, slavery. And this is how, but out of that incubator is that we have this uh, the formation, a formation of the independent church movement mm -hmm. because when David George got to, Savannah, to, uh, uh, got to Canada, he started a Baptist church in Canada. And when George Lau got to uh, Jamaica, he started the first African Baptist Church of Jamaica. Right, yeah. So this uh, proliferates right. because of this. But that's the reason Silver Bluff is so very important. But this was the birthplace of it. Yeah. So by the time uh, uh, Sherman got uh, to Savannah in 1864, you had a strong independent black church movement. In right. As a matter of fact, and there were preachers, ministers there. As a matter of fact, the minister, when Sherman got to Savannah in 1864, collectively speaking, 
uh, the, the black preachers had a total of 270 years of experience. Oh, wow. So this is the reason that Savannah is so important. Right. And when he got to Savannah, of course, the, um, the mayor of Savannah, uh, came Richard, out. Richard Arnold came out with a, you know, a surrender sign and with a, a white cloth saying, uh, uh, peace, freedom, freedom. Right. And then for God's sake, freedom. Yeah. Because he had heard about what had happened here in Atlanta. And he did not want the same thing to happen to his city. Right. So he immediately surrendered. Right. And you can see it. You can see, look at the history of just 150 years. Go to Savannah, Georgia. And the, the Confederates had run away. Had run fact, away. The, the army had run away. They abandoned the city. Right. Yeah. They ran away. Yeah. yeah. They abandoned the city. And now, guess what? The blacks are free, and now the whites are in, uh, in slave and custody. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's how the tables have turned. Right. Well, these, as I said before, you have a strong uh, uh, cadre of, of black ministers, black leaders. Your reason, uh, ministers who, uh, who, who, uh, who were leaders in Savannah. And Savannah is a uh, racial uh, composition is very important, too, is because there was not this uh, class demarcation of elitism in Savannah. Mm -hmm. They had what they call nominal slaves. These were slaves who were free, and they were slaves. In other words, they could work, uh, own jobs, uh, be a porter or whatever. As long as they paid the slave master something, he had to. Uh, they could keep some of the money for themselves. Right, right. Many of the ministers uh, who met with Sherman in 1864 were nominal slaves. They were free to go out and work, make some money, uh, but they still had to pay. Kind of like, uh, you know, with McDonald's, you do franchise. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And this was the way what we called nominal slaves. And many of the ministers were nominal slaves. Yeah. Okay? But they had had experience in leading congregations. They had experience in organizing people. They were, they were leaders. So, when they got to Savannah, that is, and the city had surrendered, uh, you know, and Sherman, uh, you know, and, uh, the, the richest man, the white man in Savannah, Charles Green, uh, to appease uh, Sherman, he turned his mansion over to Sherman mm -hmm. for his headquarters, you know. Probably and, saved it from getting burned. That's <laughs> right, you know, absolutely getting burned. And these ministers said, well, look here, we, we're free. Okay, but you know, they had been leaders. Right. And they had been, for many of them, but not all of them were nominal slaves. Some of them were being right. free. And they knew the responsibilities of freedom. And they looked at you and said, You're free, but, you know, freedom without food, without shelter, without a job. Right. That's a very precarious existence. Yeah. So we, all these people are free now, but we don't have any jobs. What are we going to do? to take care of our families, you know, right. to eat and all that. So these, there were 20 black religious leaders initiated a meeting with Sherman. And uh, when Sherman called uh, Lincoln, Lincoln sent Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War, right. because Stanton was an abolitionist and Sherman was not. Right. So Lincoln did not trust Sherman yeah. in dealing with black people. Yeah. So he sent uh, an abolitionist, Edward Stanton, yep. uh, to Savannah. And they had a meeting on January the 12th, 1864. This was probably the most, um, one of the most important meetings of the whole Civil War, on well, January the 12th, 1865. 1865, I'm sorry. Yeah. 1865. This was the very, here you have 20, black religious leaders coming to meet with Sherman and Edwin Stanton in this violence. First of all, you know, this is a cosmetic age today. They dressed up in their Sunday finest. Right. With their suits or hats, you know. I mean, dressed to kill. You know what? Men, I'm still in slavery. Just think about it. But they knew they needed, they organized us. Mm -hmm. Before they had the meeting, everybody didn't go in and try to talk. Where you had all chiefs and no Indians, but they selected it as a second leader. They, they were organized. Just amazing. Right out of slavery. Yeah. Still in slavery. Yeah. They walked through this meeting, and, you know, Gabriel uh, 
Frazier was a spokesperson, 67 years old, who had been a slave in North Carolina. He was a leader. And Sherman asked him, said, what do you black folk need to really take care of yourselves? What can the government do? And what he said, land. Right. You know, that's where we get the mantra, 40, 40 acres in the view. Right. It comes right out of that meeting. Right. You know, land. Yeah. That's where they recognize the land. And what a, what a little stroke of genius, huh? Yeah. And then they come in with a, a, a welfare mentality and said, we don't want you to give it to us. All we want is to have a chance to, you know, plant crops and we'll pay the government back. Yeah. We'll buy our, our, own, our own homes and, and not only that, but we'll encourage uh, our young men to, to, to join the army, to fight, right. you know, of America. This is what we do. But, but the other thing I think is just so, so significant and so insightful is that we just don't want to give this land to anybody. We, we want to give it to people who are respectable, who have a sense of character. Mm -hmm. We don't want to give it, we want to give it to two family uh, households uh, where you have two spouses. Mm -hmm. We want to designate it to where you have families, right. strong families. Where you have a husband and a wife. Right. Can, can you get that man? Yeah. And see, this was critical because that is part of the Achilles heels of, of, of the African American experience today is families. And that was done by slavery. Right. Because there was no respect for the family. Right. See, a black man during slavery could have a baby or make a baby, but he couldn't be the father. A black woman could have a baby, but she couldn't be the mother. Yeah. They were separated, man. And they realized that these 20 religious leaders, if we're going to have a strong community, build a strong community, we must have strong families. Right. And guess what, Brad? One of the things, if you read the literature, and it's very, very exciting, uh, during the Reconstruction period, the newspapers, is that black men, after e e emancipation, you know what they were trying to do? And they had advertisements in the newspapers and the little uh, pamphlets. And they were trying to reunite with their families. Mm -hmm. they, they, they tried to describe what the spouse or the wives looked like and, and when they were together before they got separated. And what the children looked like. You know, it, it's been 10 years now mm -hmm. since I've been separated from my little daughter. But by now she should look like this, trying to imagine. Right. Man, to make tears come to your yeah, eyes. Yeah. Because they were struggling trying to reunite with their family. Right. Yeah. And these men, these 20 men, realized this. They had this kind of foresight for right. what they had to do in terms of it. Well, let me ask you, with this, with this uh, portion of our history here, how would you draw it into today? Because you did, in your introduction, you talked about the crisis mm -hmm. in America today, not just the black church, but mm -hmm. uh, American religion. Mm -hmm. what, what do we have to learn from this, oh, what you've described? Boy, there's a cyclopedia of volumes we can learn from these 20. That's a model of black leadership. Right. That's the model of the black church. And because of these 20 black leaders, this established the black church and the black preacher as a leader of the black community. Right. The black church is the most significant institution we have in America, black or white. Right. See, because the white church is responsible for original sin. Mm -hmm. America has a birth defect. And it was slavery. Yeah. Okay. So Dr. King used to say, and I believe he was right about it, is that the salvation of America will depend on the black church. Okay. Doing well, succeeding Doing spiritually. And, and that's and, what is so disappointing. Let me put, put all the blame on white folks. It's so disappointing with black folk and the black church. Mm -hmm. The black church is in crisis today. Yeah. Going around here talking about prosperity gospel. Pimping the people. Mm -hmm. Prosperity fraud. Right. You know? You know? Uh, just using people. 
abusing the office and the leadership. The church is about serving people. Yeah. The least of these. Taking care of the community. You know, I was a pastor, if I may make an illustration, for 30 years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, today the church is almost like a country club. Second rate country club. Yeah. You know? Uh, who is this and who is Dr. This? And it's not about all of that. See, Jesus didn't go around fishing with a hook. He fished with a net. Mm -hmm. He brought everything, big mm -hmm. fish, you know, inclusive of everybody. And what I was saying about my experience as a pastor, uh, you know, uh, some of the largest uh, funerals and the uh, most celebrated weddings I had in my church were not people who had their names on the membership roll. But a lot of times the, the funerals were people who got killed on Saturday night at a club. Mm. Okay? Yeah. Okay. But my job is not to worry about whether they have ever been set foot in the church or whether they ever paid their tithes. And my church, they and me, man. My job was to serve those people. Right. And I opened the doors, man. Right. And that's what made my church a viable church because it was meeting what? The needs of the people. Yeah. It was scratching where people are itching. <laughs> but there's also this thread of, of uh, courage in this, in this episode that you account here that seems to be that, that even in the midst of the worst slavery, they were still pushing for independence, whether it be in their economically or whether it be in their church. Mm -hmm. Um, and all the way to Savannah yeah. and walking with, right. with Grant and then in Savannah, yeah. right. the, uh, what was right. happening. So is, is it a call to oh, yeah. live courageously? Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it, about, absolutely. It, no, thank you. That's, that's an insightful question. It is a call because I get it all the time with my students. You know, I teach students right. preaching over at uh, IGC. IGC. Uh, you, you just do it. It's not about, uh, you know, you, uh, you get Amos and Hosea. Uh, they didn't go before a committee. Right. It's not about getting a vote. You do it because you see it needs to be done. Right. And uh, this is is, is, is is what it's a calling to do it. Yeah. To make to have the courage to uh, to 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 to, uh, to to make uh, to to make the sacrifice. People ask me, I was involved in civil rights uh, movement in Birmingham, Alabama, back in the sixties, and. Uh, Oh, you know, and one of the questions, a lot of churches were movement churches, some were not, because they did not want the church bombed, and, uh, and they, you know, they didn't want to sacrifice, the, you know, the, the, the comfort, and the devil right. was dangerous, and, and there were other churches that were movement churches. Well, uh, when I came to Birmingham in 1963, uh, uh, my church was not one of the movement churches, but as soon as I got there, I went to the movement meeting. Right. <laughs> And I liked what was going on. Yeah. Okay? So I became a part of the movement. But I didn't have to wait until I go back to my church to vote on it. Right. Or whatever. I just showed up. Yeah. Because they were not fighting just for, for me, you know, for themselves, but they were fighting for everybody. Right. So I'm a, I'm a club member, so i got to pay my club dues. <laughs> <laughs> so I need to get involved, yeah. and that's the reason I got involved. But now we have a, you know, uh, we are so busy doing church work, do we fail to do the work in the church? Yeah. And the work of the church is serving the community, uh, being a voice for the voiceless. Right. You know, uh, you know, it's uh, we are not the sugar of the earth; we are the salt of the earth. Yeah. You know, no cross, no crown. Right. If you haven't found something worth. Dying for you're not fit to live. Yeah. Look at Martin Luther King. I'm not saying everybody's going to go out and do what Martin Luther King has done. He was only 38 years old mm -hmm. when he was assassinated. Yeah. You know, and it was for the cause. It was for the struggle. You know, and this is and the struggle goes on. And what is so happening now with leadership across the board and all of our institutions? There is a lack of accountability. And when you don't have accountability, mm. it breeds corruption. Right. From the White House to the Blue House. Everybody. Everywhere in between. In between. You need some accountability. Yeah. The reason our institutions are in the trouble they're in, many of the black institutions, is because of a lack of accountability. Right. That's the reason. Yeah. And that 
that's you know that, that's the, one of the uh, serious challenges of the 21st century right. in the whole area of leadership. So I think the whole matter here about these 20 religious leaders, uh, this independent uh, religious leaders, uh, independent institutions, uh, Bishop Daniel Payne, who was a bishop in the AME Church, mm -hmm. I wrote about him, uh, uh, who uh, had a very insightful uh, article on independent black churches. Mm -hmm. uh, we need independent black churches. We need independent black schools. Not that we don't want to be inclusive, right. but there's a uniqueness about the black experience. Right. We don't say anything about Jews having uh, uh, Brandeis, their schools. Mm -hmm. We don't say anything about them having their synagogues, um, you know, because they are it's just an ethnic group, a religious group, and um, they have things that they do, and uh, that's unique to their experience. And this is true, I think, of all ethnic groups in this country, the Irish, the Italians, uh, you know, and for African Americans, we definitely need our uh, African American schools because we have a unique experience. All the other immigrants in this country came over here as free immigrants. Right. But we are the only ones who came over here in chains. Mm -hmm. And we're in chains for almost 400 years. Yeah. And we've only been out of chain 150 years. Yeah. It's almost miraculous at the progress that has happened to America and African Americans in 150 years. Right. I'm 77 years old. Yes. Half that time. Half that time. Yeah. You know? And look at us now. Everywhere, doing some of everything. Yeah. Good and bad. Yeah. And in between. Yeah. Okay. In just a few years, man. But we have a mission. Yeah. We have a responsibility. The job is not finished. We have unfinished work to do. Like Frederick Douglass, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. Yeah. You might not get all you pay for, but you got to pay for all you get. Yeah. And this is for every generation yeah. for us to remember this. Well, that's great. Dr. Welch, well, that's a call. That's a good place to end on that call. Okay, I'm finished, but I'm not through. I know, absolutely. <laughs> Once again, we were talking with Dr. Welchel, professor at ITC, for uh, his new book at Palgrave Press, Sherman's March and the Emergence of the Independent Black Church Movement. Thank you so much for Thank being you, here. Once again, passion uh, coming through onto the camera. Oh, yeah. I appreciate it very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for having me. All right. Don't, don't let this be the last time. No. <laughs> no. All right.